Hey there, Julie. Hello, Bob. So tell me your ideas for a cinematic Lion King remake. Gladly. It begins as before with the sun rising in Africa, though it is half CG and half real footage. So you're looking to combine live action and animation then? Exactly, but it's not like every other movie does it. You see, it's not about the technology. It's about the feel of the world and the characters. It'll be like my Broadway show. Same songs and characters, but on a more unique and grander scale. We'll still have actors and costumes, but it'll be less puppets and more clothes, similar to what I did in the film Titus. So like in that film, it takes place in no time period and every time period. 100%. And it's kind of a Jesus Christ superstar vibe. But won't people miss the elaborate costumes from your stage show? Well, we don't want to give people what they've already seen, do we? We want to give them new ideas against a familiar story. I see what you're saying. There will be no big Hollywood stars. All the actors will be African, and we'll build the environment out of African culture, artwork, and history. It'll be like Black Panther mixing modern technology with timeless traditions to create something new yet classic. Black Panther was beloved by a lot of people. The battles will be comprised of the finest fight choreography with the actors carrying wrist blades that look similar to claws. It'll be more violent than the other Disney remakes, showing that we want to grow up with our Disney audience and not treat them like children forever. We've currently been experimenting with that. At the end, when the circle of life is sung once more, a real baby is held up and the world is revealed to be a mix of modern day Africa and years of history that inspired the stage show. So we represent the complicated past with the complicated future, not just for Africa, but the human animal as a whole, fighting for the power, justice, and unity. Wow. Well, that sounds brilliant. You like it? It's challenging, it's brave, it pushes the boundaries of not only what Disney can do, but what cinema can do. And it doesn't have to be that expensive. It's not about looking real, it's about feeling real. Absolutely. Wonderful. So shall we start production next year? Oh, we're not going to make it. What? No, I set up this meeting to see what we shouldn't do for a Lion King remake. I just took everything you said and wrote down the complete opposite. But why? You're a thinker, Julie, and people don't want that. We want to give them comfort food under the guise of something deep and timeless, even though we're just feeding folks the same old Don't you want to challenge and evolve and enlighten your fan base? Not as much as I want to make money. Well, that was the saddest featurette I've ever seen. It's time to get up. Do we have to, Chaplin? Nope. All right, Buster. Now we really should get up. But I was seeing if I slept like this if I would dream upside down. That's as brilliant as me sleeping on a mirror to see if I dream backwards. So what are we going to do today, Chaplin? It's time you learn the benefits of becoming the next cash cow. Wow! I'm Chaplin. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. Wow, and how about that shadowy stuff? That's ours too. We're cats. We own everything. Got it. As a cat on an online show, I serve as the series cash cow. But one day, Buster, the sun will set on my time here and will rise with you as the new cash cow. And this will all be mine? If you pee on it, yes. And I can do whatever I want? Buster, there's more to being a cat than getting your way all the time. There's more? Actually, no, that's it. Hooray! But, dear nephew, son, or brother, you must learn the ways of being a profitable cash cow. Well, how do I learn? By watching our master, the Nostalgia Critic, talk about one of the biggest cash cows of all time, the Lion King. Which one? The original or the remake? There is no difference between them, yet they still make money. Wow, that is a cash cow. Now, let's see our master scorn the gods again. Is his face usually that red? Only when he talks about recent Disney films. Ooh. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, what can I say that everyone else hasn't already said about this movie? It's spectacular. That's something that hasn't been said about it yet. 
but we all know it's and yet our nostalgia made us see it. So I guess the real question is, what the is wrong with us? The 2019 Lion King remake was laughed at by many, but in the end, it's Disney who had the last laugh, all the way to the bank. For a while, it was the highest grossing animated film. Not adjusted for inflation, I don't even think it cracks the top five when you factor that. Frozen 2 would eventually beat it out, yay. But the writing was on the wall, this was a massive hit. Despite critics and online crybabies like myself complaining about how shallow and uninspiring it is, the typical movie going public ate it up like warthogs in a blanket. Ew. As much as people like to make fun of it, there's clearly a fan base for it. So the questions then become, what's wrong with the film, how can it be fixed, who enjoys it, what's their addresses, and how much can I produce in paper bags on their birthdays? Let's analyze the how, why, and... No, no, I'm still stuck on the why. This is Lion King 2019. Ooh, we're gonna get some good information here, huh, Buster? Buster? Just a second, I feel like if I grab this string, I'll change the world! Stop being cute, as if that has anything to do with being a cash cow. I'm Buster! I'm Buster! The film immediately mocks us with the logo in the traditional hand-drawn style Lion King was praised for. It'd be like the author of Artemis Fowl opening that film with, I think we're in good hands. We open on the only live-action shot in the entire movie, which... I guess I should clear up some confusion. This is a fully animated feature. Despite the media calling it a live-action remake, Disney never officially referred to it as such. Though they didn't go out of their way to correct anybody, either. My guess is they liked that people thought some of it had to be real, and... I'll be honest, I was 100% convinced at least the backgrounds were shot in Africa. It fooled me, and that's not an easy thing to do when it comes to CG. So, on a technical level, I do have to give them a lot of credit. But then this raises a question. If the entire film is animated, why does it look so ugly? Africa is gorgeous, such a wide variety of colors, shapes, and environments. The original took advantage of being animated and magnified even more how grand and epic their landscapes are. It's one of the few movies where whenever it's released on the big screen, I always buy a ticket to go see it. Here, every shot looks like it was soaked in cat and dried off with monkey it's hideous. But part of the reason for that may be that the director, John Favreau, said he wanted the film to look like a BBC documentary. So he didn't go for a lot of pretty shots because he felt like it wouldn't have looked as realistic. Okay, I guess I can understand trying to create a style and trying to go for realism over fantasy and stuff. There's just one problem. Animals don't talk! Realism ruined! Yeah, a lot of it looks like it's really there and that's a credit to the animators, but the idea as a whole doesn't work. If you told the story without any talking or songs, granted it would have been very difficult and incredibly risky, I would see how that could work and would tip my hat to such a daring idea, even if it failed. 101 Dalmatians did something similar and that turned out okay. But this makes no sense. If you want us to have a connection, you either have to embrace the human emotion of the characters or the realism of the animals. You can't do both. Because the warm, welcoming embrace of two friends who have known each other for years now looks like a janitor just doing his Thursday thing. There's no heart in it whatsoever. Even the other animals have a look like, ah, was that today? All right, buck up. We have to pretend we like the people who are going to eat us in the future. It's the same. Doesn't even stand. The ruler of this great circle isn't even worth a little energy in your legs. With that, though, a mouse. Yeah, this was only a few seconds in the original, but now it's given over a minute of screen time because it's so vitally important. No, no, they're not just showing off their technology like maybe what this whole entire movie is. Uh-uh. This is crucial story going on here. Will the mouse <gasps> Will the mouse You don't even get that giant paw coming down that literally shook the theater when you saw it on the big screen. Scar just emerges out of the shadows like every villain and everything. But they look real. It's a waste of time, but at least it's a realistic looking waste of time. The way I see it, we both want to find a way out. Scar, played by Chittatao Egafor, and yes, I did have to watch a video to figure out how to pronounce that. Dude, I just watched the video and the lady pronounced it Chiwetel Ejiofor. Like, it's literally pronounced exactly like it's spelled. But I blame English spelling for this. Like, why does the pronunciation in English words have to be so weird? Yeah, I could go on a rant about this, but, um, oh, oh, by the way, I'm sorry, Surreal Kangaroo, for making another one of these interjections again, but I really felt like this point in particular was best addressed in video form like this, like me on screen, but 
because you have to hear what I'm saying in order to get the point. So anyway, let's move on. Is approached by Zazu, played by John Oliver, who was kind enough to leave Rowan Atkins in the charm of his interpretation by bringing a buttload of annoyance to his. I had a cousin who thought he was a woodpecker. He slammed his head into trees, and our beaks aren't built for it. He was concussed. Tonight's story, me. Why aren't I funny here? Mufasa Arise, voiced again by James Earl Jones, who clearly should have played Simba's grandfather as opposed to father as at almost 90 years old. Every line delivery sounds like it's gonna be followed by, didn't I already say this? Don't turn your back on me, Scar. Perhaps you shouldn't turn your back on me. <laughs> Is that a challenge? Uh, no, seriously, I did say this over 20 years ago, right? These scenes and lines are so recycled, I'm amazed someone was actually credited for writing them. In fact, anything added is usually bottom-of-the-barrel cliches, including... As you know, I have respect. Yep, another appearance of the most cliché line of all, as you know. For as I and many critics before me have pointed out, if you already know, why is it being said? As you know. As you all know. As you may know. As you may know. As you know. As you know, I conducted a raid on the Great Library. I expected more from the writer of... Huh? No, maybe I didn't. Later, Rafiki, voiced by John Connie, makes an artistic interpretation of his true ruler. No, not Simba. Ha <laughs> ha! Right, I rule your ass. Now tell me the Lady and the Tramp remake was amazing! You made that? Why does nobody know we made that?! As time goes by, Simba, played by J.D. McRae, learns from his father how to be a good leader. While others search for what they can take, a true king searches for what he can give. Like a d what the filmmakers are not giving in this movie. Uh, ten flamingos are taking a stand. Uh Again, the scenes play exactly like the original. Simba pounces on Zazu. Scar tells him about the elephant graveyard. He tells his friend Nala, played this time by Shahadi Wright Joseph. And all of it is done with the incredible advantage of having no expression whatsoever. Why? So they can look real. Zazu goes, or you don't. God! Okay, here's the problem. If you want to go fantasy and make them talk, fine. If you want to go real and not make them talk, also fine. But you have to choose one because we interpret them differently. Buster, where are you? It's important that you hear this. Hi, Buster! You certainly are. Take, for example, our kitty friends. When you hear them talk, you know what they're thinking. But watch what happens when you view them on mute. They still have expressions, but you're reading them differently, aren't you? You have to look at the subtlety of their eyes, their walk, their tails. It's a different way of communicating than verbal speech. So when you're not just doing this for a laugh and need to convey legit dramatic emotion, combining two totally different ways to read that emotion isn't going to feel authentic. Isn't that right, guys? Oh, uh, you can talk now. He went completely silent for a whole minute! I'm scared! I'm Chaplin! I should have gotten dogs. The film truly does want to get every little detail down, even keeping that Zazu can't sing. Out of service and out of Africa, I wouldn't hang about! Yet somehow he's still better than Emma Watson. Ah. The cubs head towards the elephant graveyard while also roughhousing. I think that's what this is supposed to be. Pinja! The stunts in Dolomite looked more aggressive. Come on! I don't know, Simba. This looks pretty underwhelming. Why are we even supposed to be afraid? It looks like every other <laughs> landscape in the movie. By the way, when did Nala become such a wet blanket? Simba, we're way beyond the Pride Land. Come on. It means we can go home. You've proved how brave you are. Yeah, remember the original when she was just as hungry for trouble as Simba? We could get in big trouble. I know. I wonder if its brains are still in there. Now it's Simba, get down, it could be dangerous! Simba, get down, it could be dangerous. Hey, remember when they get older and you have that great contrast of her growing up, accepting responsibility and him staying a child dodging his responsibilities? Nah, I thought that was lame too. Now, she's always been responsible. That's a great way to show growth and make us like her more. Everybody loves a stick in the mud! The sun is going down and I'm not just gonna sit here- OH SHUT UP! Another change is that the hyenas actually have a leader. Well, yeah, but a another leader. I guess. It's Shenzi, played by Florence Kasumba. 
I wonder how all that bravery will taste. She's intimidating and all, but still completely pointless. They don't really do much with her except have her look at Simba's mother once, and that suddenly builds this great rivalry for them to fight at the end. At least I got some laughs out of Goldberg's interpretation. Here, the only attempts at laughter are from a neutered Eric Andre and Keegan-Michael Key. Stay for dinner? Yeah, stay for dinner. We have talked about this. I come in alone. I'm the lead distraction so everyone can circle. Oh, they're doing the intimidated speech interrupted by somebody thing. Yeah, yeah, it was already dated in A Bug's Life. The sun grows the food. The ants pick the food. The grasshoppers eat the food. And the birds eat the grasshoppers. Hey, like the one that nearly ate you, you remember? You're not bringing it back. Mufasa saves them, though honestly, I feel like the hyenas could take him. There's only three in the original. And Simba gets in big trouble. I thought you were very brave. Was he? You literally cut out the only part where he was brave, where he scratches one of them, so all he did was run. If this was actually realistic, she'd say, Mufasa talks with Simba in a powerfully emotional moment, so let's shoot it as far away as possible on their backs. You deliberately disobeyed me. You could have been killed. And what's worse, you put Nala in danger. I mean, I said this line for line. Can I at least have my coffee so I don't have to say it half awake? No? You just want it done quick and people's nostalgia will fill in the emotion? Okay. This is weird. Back at the graveyard, Scar approaches the hyenas and tells them his plan to kill Mufasa. Mufasa is yesterday's message. A clapped out, distracted regime. Um, is he singing? I don't know, are we in a song? The need for a different dream. Okay, that part rhymed. I think we're in a song. It was pretty clear last time we were in a song. Meticulous planning, tenacity spanning, decay. Why isn't he singing though? I don't know. The last guy can sing. Maybe he can't either. Be nope, that guy can sing. Did they just amputate the best song in the movie then? Isn't that what we've been doing since the Disney logo? Like our videos? Subscribe to be notified about them. Want to actually be notified about them? Click on that bell as well. Also, don't forget to check us out on Twitch. Playing some games, telling some jokes, and overall having a good time. Hope to see you there. So after taking one of the most awesome villain songs ever and turning it into a poem with YouTube's music library under it, you deserve all that money. Scar takes Simba to the gorge where a trap is waiting for it. My dad was pretty upset with me. Yeah, he looked really f***ed off. This gorge is where all lions come to find their roar. Their dead eyes, blank stares, and indifferent movements sadly are stuck with us forever. <laughs> As you'd expect, Simba roars and he thinks he starts a stampede. And honestly, this is a pretty pathetic looking stampede. I know I'm being kind and not comparing every scene to the original as, again, the style is supposed to be so real, but this doesn't look like it would kill anybody. If anyone was stuck in this stampede, you know they're Bambi's mom, but here, if somebody fell, they could just get right back up. One of them does! Oh, that's annoying. Well, back to the triathlon. I'll just leave that part out of the Facebook post. Everything about this moment is half the intensity of the original. Just listen to this delivery. Simba! Come to me, son! Jump! It's like he said every important line while doing something else. I could see him eating lunch while saying that. Simba! Come to me, son! Jump! It's over, Mufasa! I have the high ground! Scar, help me. No, really, help me. I'm totally in distress, you know? So, the next two scenes back to back are so funny, I actually bursted out laughing in the theater. The first is rather than that epic toss sending Mufasa to his death, Scar oddly slaps him before letting go. School is that? 
A chilling line like long live the king shouldn't be said before that. It should be your door. Ouch! Susie likes me, not you. Ouch! Hold on, you got something on your face. See you next fall! But I'm funny. That was not funny! It was so funny! And the other is Simba's pathetic cry as he watches his father perish. Remember how big and heart pounding it was in the original? <laughs> Look what they replace it with! The scenes are supposed to get the biggest laughs getting dead silence, yet the scenes you're supposed to be dead silent are getting the biggest laughs. That's not a blood curling cry, that's the Meow Mix Cat finding out he got traded to Fancy Feast. Meow 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 Simba approaches his dad, who doesn't feel too good, Mr. Stark. Come on, wake up. He's so emotionless and lacking life. But that's how he always is, how can I tell if anything's wrong? Yep, the most emotional scene from the original is given to us completely empty. If you actually feel anything here, I assure you it's a holdover from how well it was done before. Dad? I can only stare at you with benign indifference for so long! Yeah, remember how you looked at Scar in the original like that he tore a loving father from his dear son? Now it's like he was kind of on his way out already. Every line sounded like Joe Biden just woke up from a nap. Stampede in the porch! Simba's down there! Simba? You interrupted my toaster strudel for that. The rest is, again, scene by scene from the first. Gar tells him to run when he could have just killed him there. The hyenas chase him, he gets away, and vultures pick at him the same way Disney is picking at the corpse of this franchise. But there's something on the horizon. Enter the only entertaining part of the movie, Timon and Pumbaa, played by Seth Rogen and Billy Eichner. Maybe because they improvised and weren't bound to the paint-by-number script everyone else was? But these two have legit funny lines, a good amount of energy, and active personalities. You can call them the toasty of the movie that's so rarely seen. So, how are you in as few words as possible? He'll be on our side! I've got it. What if he's on our side? Hear me out! With that said, they do still have to sing that song. It means no worries for the rest of your days. And while Eichner does a pretty good job singing, Rogan ain't no passing craze. It just became the 11th commandment. When I was a young warthog. Don't you love this? You take the guy who can sing and have him talk through his song and have the guy who can't belt every note he can't reach. You know, maybe they can bring back the kid who dubbed Jonathan Taylor Thomas. It'd be obvious, but Disney didn't care then, they wouldn't care now. It means no worries for the rest of your days. Yeah, say it, kid. So, with Timon and Pumbaa being the one thing the film got right, Simba grows up into, please you no. Know, okay, you got two things right. Just getting in the groove. Now let's leave him wanting more. Yeah, you've grown 400 pounds since we started. Well, back at Pride Rock, Scar destroys the land, though it's honestly hard to tell. Didn't it always look that ugly? We have to do something, Sarabi. We have to fight. Nala, played now by Beyonce, decides she needs to leave and get help. This was explained fine in the original, but for some reason we need an additional six minutes to show this. Much like the Beauty and the Beast remake, most of the things taken out are vital, and most of the things added are pointless. But it's cool, we have an essential scene where Simba's dander gets to Rafiki. You remember that scene in the original that just took a couple of seconds? Well, now we're shown the entire journey! An additional three minutes is added just looking at this hunk of fur. Why? Why? Is it gonna get in a knife fight with the feather from Forrest Gump? Does it symbolize how the movie is a small fraction of Simba rolled up in a giant ball of What is the point of any of this? He clearly doesn't understand that any part of a cat is important and worth watching. Like when we lick our privates? Buster! Wait, YouTube, would you watch that? <coughs> Especially when we lick our privates! Hooray! Hooray! I think. Simba. Simba is alive. And he smells like a bowl of <coughs> He smells like a bowl of Timon and Pumbaa sing The Lion Sleeps Tonight because so realistic. But Nala attacks. Simba stops her though. You see, Timon, how come we're not like that anymore? Nala? They quickly recognize each other though and are blown away having not seen each other for years. Simba, we need to leave. Okay, I guess not that blown away. 
Man, you really don't appreciate a character until you see them botched, do ya? I liked Nala fine, though I never saw her as anything that great. But not only is this one dead serious all the time, but she doesn't even appropriately react to seeing her childhood friend back from the dead. I want you to meet my best friend, Nala. Nala, you're gonna love it here. This place is amazing. Simba, we need to leave. The original worked organically. They were excited. They caught up. She expressed how much she missed him. They had a song together. Then she brings up his responsibility to fight for the throne. Here it's, hey, been a long time. Good to see you. Get your back home before I whoop your kuda matata. It makes the intro to the song way more out of nowhere and as many have pointed out, can you feel the love tonight isn't even sung at night. Not even early evening. The real lyric should have been, Can you feel the love mid to late afternoon, maybe two-ish? You can't even give us the time of day without f***ing up the time of day! And you know who's to blame for all of this? You! Huh? And you! Huh? And you! Huh? You're all to blame for this! And who are we? You're the common movie goers I just made up! Well, thanks for wishing us into existence. Why'd you wish me on a toilet, though? You may not have specific names, but you're the reason this movie was a hit! What? So we like a movie? <laughs> big deal. The big deal is you're encouraging a creative juggernaut to keep turning out more Hey, come on. We work our off every week. Sometimes we just need something mindless to watch. Yeah, I like seeing a more realistic child thing I grew up with. It makes me feel more adult. Oh, you think you're a big boy, huh? I am a big boy! Well, just because something looks real doesn't mean it feels real. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's all you have to say? Look, man, it's great that you analyze movies for a deeper meaning, but sometimes we want to not think. And Disney remakes are great for that. What? You don't want to be challenged? Sometimes, I guess, but mostly we just want a distraction. Something to take away from everyday stress. Yeah, don't you have any distractions you don't think too hard about? Like giving your cats voices or something? I can speak for myself, thank you very much. Yeah, imagine a grown man doing these voices. Absurd. Puppycock. Puppy sir. Abscock. Fine, you go about watching your dumb little remakes and I'll continue to go about judging you. You were going to judge us even if we didn't watch them. That's true. Still don't know why you put me on the toilet. Simba and Nala fight like in the last film, and he comes across Rafiki shortly after, saying he can show him his father. Your father is waiting. You dug him up? What kind of sick monkey are you? Asante Sada, there's your father. We of course get his father in the clouds, but it's not even that clear it's him. Again, you'd have to give him emotional expression, or he'd just look like the MGM logo. But we can't do that because it's not real. So we just look at this blueberry fart the whole time. How magical. Remember who you are. Remember. And to make things worse, maybe the biggest insult of all, the scene with the stick is missing. The past can hurt, but the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Yes, the whole moral of the story in a fantastic analogy is cut. I was dumbfounded when I saw that. In fact, another important line is cut. Remember when he says you've forgotten who you are, so you've forgotten me? You have forgotten who you are, and so forgotten me. But don't worry, it was replaced with tons of minutes of grumpy Nala, a mouse, and dung beetle. Yeah, I know why they cut that one out. Because it perfectly sums up this movie. Lion King forgot what made itself special by ignoring what was most important. Which is why I can assure you, even though this one made a ton of money, it will fade into obscurity while this one will live on forever. You better hope there's an amazing scene to follow this up. Mon cher, mademoiselle, we proudly present your dinner. Fight it. Fight it. Be our <laughs> Those two are like fried breading! They're always the best part! Scene for scene, Simba confronts Scar and he forces Simba to reveal the truth. Who's responsible for Mufasa's death? It was me. It's not true. Cancel Simba! Cancel Simba! As before, Scar whispers the truth in his ear, causing a flashback. <laughs> it looks even worse in slow-mo. The Simba fights back and gets the lionesses on his side. He defeats Scar, the hyenas kill him for betraying them, and Simba takes his place as king. Hooray, lions can eat us again instead of the hyenas! Yeah, we're still pretty 
in this two-party system. Now look at me, I voted for Libertarian Pumba. And that was Lion King 2019. It's so empty. It's like an empty jar marked fun, but there's only air inside. No, not even that, because they sucked all the air out of it. I know it made a ton of money and most people just see it as a harmless kids film, but look at it this way. Selling drugs to kids makes you money too, but it's still wrong. This is like creative drugs. Instead of killing brain cells, they kill originality. And judging by the success of their other remakes, they're just as addictive. Though the technology is impressive, I don't get why people celebrate remaking what's already perfectly fine when nothing new or interesting is added. While the casting is decent and Timon and Pumbaa get a few laughs, I don't see this one being as valued as the original. As the saying goes, there can only be one king, and I think it's obvious which one I, and other fans of good storytelling, see as the true ruler. And you know what? I'm gonna give the director a piece of my mind! Yeah, my desk has Skype buttons now. You know what, Kathleen, hold on. I g give me one second. I got somebody bothering me. You know, I hope this is important. I'm working on Mandalorian Season 2. John Favreau, how can you make something as terrible as The Lion King? Ugh, this again. Look, I'd love to chat and figure out how you got this contact, but I'm pouring my blood, sweat, and tears into this thing, okay? No, we've been talking about this for hours. We need to keep him an anti-hero. That's what makes him complex and interesting. And another thing... Excuse me, sir. You're what? supposed to direct this shot for Lion King 2. Oh, I forgot I was doing it. Lion King 2? <gasps> You're not ruining the incredible okayness of Simba's pride! Put Simba... there. Or... there. You know what? Uh, right between the giraffe's legs, uh, underneath the... Yes, sir. When are we going to reintroduce Bill Burr? Wait, you barely gave me a direction. Oh, yeah. Well, I do these animal movies, so Disney will let me do what I really want. Well, as a critic, I question your creative... Hey, as a director, I got to pick my battles. Know what I mean? B but I don't... Uh... Look, do you like my remakes? No. Do you like The Mandalorian? Yeah! Well, I can't make one without the other. The money The Lion King made would pay for six seasons of The Mandalorian. But the original Lion King... Is still around. And look, all those animators had to work on a bunch of shit they didn't want to before they could get to that. You think everybody wanted to animate the wuzzles? But your remake was so bad! Bad enough not to see any more Mandalorian? No. You do your thing, focusing on my bad stuff, and I'll do my thing, focusing on my good stuff. I... Yes, that makes sense. I don't care. I have to get back to work. Sir, the scene. Looks great. Now let's talk about how our villain has to run a fast food chicken restaurant. <sighs> so, do you understand now, Buster? I think so. In order to be a cash cow, you have to give the people what they want. Even if what they want is Yeah! So, we're gonna see a lot more bear remakes, huh? Looks like it. But in the long run, they help us produce the good stuff. And we'll appreciate them all the more. Ready to give the people the fluff they deserve. Not the fluff they deserve, Buster, but the fluff they need. That makes no sense. I don't care. I am the Cash Cow. And I'm Batman. I don't care. I have to get back to work. Sir, this scene. Look. Sorry. <laughs> Sir, this scene. How dare! <laughs> I'm John Favreau. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, thanks for wishing us into existence. Oh, okay. Hey, I want a blooper too. Oh, microphone. Mmm, tastes inedible. More. Ain't no passing craze. Hey, Doug Walker here doing the charity shout out. Uh, this week we're doing something a little different in that it's actually what we usually do. Uh, this is a, a charity that's not tied into uh, COVID-19 and the reason is uh, back in C2E2, it's a big con in Chicago, um, somebody came up and gave me this shirt 
uh, for my dad. And if you can't see that, this is Operation Combat Bike Saver. And uh, they came up, or uh, the dude came up, and he was really, really nice. He knew my dad served uh, in the Navy. And he was like, you know, hey, you know, one of your charity shout outs, could you give a shout out for this? And I'm like, oh, sure, sure. Uh, but soon after, you know, COVID happened, and, uh, you know, I've been doing charities to get attention on that. Uh, but but we, we've done a fair amount, <laughs> I feel like. So this time, I just wanted to try a different charity from someone that came up to me and specifically requested it. And I checked it out. It's a really, really, a uh, uh, cool charity, it seems like, and I will read you the uh, exact details about what they do here. Uh, Operation Combat Bike Saver provides a workshop for veterans suffering from PTSD and or TBI and or depression. Once the project is completed by the candidate, it is theirs to keep or donate to another candidate of their choosing at no cost to the precipitant. Uh, they will be introduced to building, fabricating, wielding, and painting to resurrect something that was once damaged and forgotten into something new and truly unique while rebuilding themselves at the same time. And this is a direct quote uh, from the site here. We have lost way too many to PTSD, TBI, and depression. All of us here at Operation Combat Bike Saver have lost someone to the after effects of defending their country and community. We would love nothing more than to help <coughs> than to help our heroes return to feeling normal again. So as you can see, this is a really, really good organization. Such a unique idea. I mean, you do not hear that uh, uh, that kind of thing thrown around a lot. I, I mean, repairing bikes, but also repairing people as well. And uh, the dude I talked to was really sweet, really nice. So definitely check out the site. Like I said, it's such a, a neat idea and it's such a, a cool way of uh, uh, trying to tackle this. So check them out. Donate if you can. Volunteer. And even if you can't do that, spread the word. Just take the link and spread it on your social media or whatever. Because uh, as I always say, there's so many people trying to do so much good and they deserve so much attention. Thank you so much.